my name is Adriana Picarau. I am um, an assistant professor of data science at the School of Information here at the University of Arizona. Uh, I got my, I just finished my PhD, defended in February in second language acquisition and teaching. Some of you know uh, this program is SLAT here at the University of Arizona. Uh, I've been working with Crow, um, which uh, is a, a research group and also an online, online platform and a corpus uh, for four years now. So today we're going to do the corpus data scraping. We're going to create a corpus of Amazon reviews um, and then do some sentiment analysis. And then the, the workshop description is a critical perspective of, of, of sentiment analysis because that's something that I have some issues with the way people usually do it. So we're going to hopefully approach these issues and, and hopefully when you see some sentiment analysis out there on Twitter, especially Twitter, it loves like the R community, the R stats community on Twitter, they love sentiment analysis. And I was like, right, really? I don't know. So let's see, so we're going to be talking about a little bit about that too, as well. Okay. So like I mentioned, there is a link for the general plan I'm following today. Let me close this. You do see my uh, weird pink orange screen, right? Can you say yes? Oh, thank you. Right. I also made my cursor a little bigger, so hopefully you'll be able to see it uh, better. So we're going to start. Uh, let me just do an overview before I do. So install R in our studio. I hope you. Um, you did install in uh, our studio and we're going to start our R studio project, which is a, what I usually do. You can do whatever. Yeah, so this, sorry, I just saw a question in the chat. This is going to be recorded and available on YouTube. So there is no reason to, for you to record it. It's going to be publicly available on YouTube and I'm going to send you a link to it later. Um, I'm going to do the steps I do for any R project I work on, and I work on many R projects. So the first thing I do is that on my desktop, I'm going to create a folder. And I'm going to call this, let me see what I'm going to call it. Okay, you name it. I changed my mouse and then now it's kind of weird. Uh, I'm going to call it, this is where my, my R project is going to live. And I create an R project so things are more organized. So I can, when I open the project and I know what data uh, there is there and uh, what scripts, right? So I don't get all mixed up. So I'm going to, you can call this whatever you want. I'm going to call it uh, Pro Workshop 01, but you can call it Corpus Amazon review analysis or something like that. So now I have my folder. I'm going to open our studio. I already have it open here. Um, so I'm going to create a project. So there are the several ways to create a project on our studio. You can click on this uh, icon on the top right. And you see that I have a bunch of projects and you, do, you can do new project. You can also create this new project icon on the top left and you can go file new project. So I already created a, um, a folder on my desktop. So I already have a, a directory. I already have a folder, so existing directory. And I'm just gonna browse to that folder. I can find it. What did I call it again? <laughs> desktop. Oh, I'm not on desktop. That's right. Data modified. Here it is. So I'm going to open it. So I just went new project, existing directory. I navigated to my existing folder folder I just created. And then I'm going to create, click on create project. 
like I said, I always do this. This is part of my um, organization. It keeps things more organized. So each project is self-contained. So the next step is for us to create a new R script. So R scripts are like little documents with your commands. So you can rerun them and then you rerun your analysis um, when you need to. Uh, so all of these steps is for you to make sure you're doing reproducible analysis with reproducible research. So when you have to recreate, like often, like when you get a paper accepted, for example, you will often they ask you for a higher resolution of your charts, right? So you can just rerun your analysis, get the same results, um, and just change the resolution of your images, for example. So I'm going to click, click on this new file here on the top. There is a, an icon. And then I'm going to create a new R script. And then now I have another panel open with my R script, which I'm going to save. Um, and I'm going to call it. Again, I number, I like numbering my scripts. I'm going to do zero one one because this is the first one. And this is uh, data scraping. And I usually say what the script contains, right? So the first step we're going to do is actually acquire data from, um, from Amazon for the Amazon reviews. I'm going to save it. And then you see here in my bottom right panel that I have that script over there in the project, right? So I can access all of my scripts. Another reason to have a project. Um, okay. I was just saying that I say okay a lot. Uh, I realized this in class. I'm glad I don't have to uh, hear myself, like listen to my own videos. <laughs> So well, now we're going to start with step two in the in the document I shared with you. It's a web page, actually. We're going to be using three libraries today. Tidyverse is what I use for all my data analysis, uh, and is what I teach. Tidyverse way. You may if you have any experience with R, you may have used Base R. I'm not against base R, but the reason I use R is because of tidyverse. Um, and I'll show you what, what the difference is. Um, the other two packages we're going to use is tidy text. Uh, tidy refers to the type of data. Um, so sorry, I just saw a, a question in the chat. So it's not the save button, it's like go file, new, new file, R script to create a new script. And then there should be a save button there. So there is no save function. It's new, new file, new R script. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so moving on, uh, continue actually to what I was saying. Tidy, uh, Tidyverse is actually a collection, is a universe of packages, right? Of tidy packages. Tidy data refers to data that are that you have you have a table that is one column is for each variable and one row for each observation. That's what the tidy comes from because there is such a thing as tidy data and messy data, uh, and we want to work with tidy data. So tidy text is the package that um, in the tidy universe that um, has a lot of functions for dealing with text like tokenization we're going to be talking about and harvest uh is supposed to be like i think it's supposed it's the icon is a harvest so its idea is to harvest or scrape data uh is a package to download websites and um, extract data from from the websites so these are the websites the three sorry packages we're going to be installing you just need to install these packages once and then you can use library to call them. So the analogy here is that you install packages, you acquire the book, you buy a book, and then you have that in your library. Every time you need to use it, you have to open the book, right? Or get it out of the shelf. So that's what library is for. So you install packages only once, unless you're updating them. Um, and you, every time you want to use them, you call library. So let's do that. I'm going to... Make a, I do a, make a lot of comments as well. So I'm gonna use the uh, pound sign for comments. 
and this pound sign space. <laughs> so people don't do space. I you should do space. Uh, install packages. Um, oh, let me move. I have a little thing here. I know if this works well. It's a key caster. So you see what command keys I'm pressing. So this should be shift. I don't know if it's very visible. Uh, saving it, I, you probably see that I do save a lot. I do command. I have, I'm on a Mac. Command is equivalent to control on um, Mac, uh, Windows. And I do command S a lot to save. Install packages. So install dot. So I started typing. That's another reason I write our studio. I, install, I started typing install, and then it shows me options for autocomplete. Uh, I can choose which option I want. I want the first one, install, not installed, install packages. I don't have to type all the way everything. I can hit tab on my keyboard to autocomplete. So I install packages between quotes. Um, I put the name of the package because what this is doing is like by the name, is retrieving from CRAN, which is a repository of packages that package to install it in your computer. So let's do tidy text first. Oh, and to run, I just ran and I didn't tell you how to. You can be anywhere in the line. You can click run here and then run is gonna run that line. You don't have to select everything. To select everything, you're just gonna run whatever is selected. No need to do that. Uh, what I do is like I hold command and press enter and that runs. Uh, I'm stalling our uh, text three times. That's fine. Uh, so what I do is I, I do command enter. I'm gonna install the next, next package, which is tidyverse. This is gonna take a little longer if you don't have it. In my computer, it's gonna be much faster because I already have it. Uh, but if you don't have it, it might take a little while because it needs to install several packages. Uh, and install packages, harvest. If uh, R Studio prompts you with a question, say no. <laughs> so the question they, the R Studio might ask you is like, do you want to compile from source? Say no. Do you want to restart our studio? Click no. All right. So you know you you could I could have installed this in just one line. I do like to install my packages individually just to make sure that everything looks good. And by looks good, is I get a message the download binary packages are in, you know, error messages, right? Um, I'm gonna comment this out. So next time I run this, I don't I don't need to install it. So I'm just gonna comment this out so I don't run it again because I often run whole scripts. And now we can load libraries, the libraries we're going to use, which are right now I'm gonna load tidy verse, yes, tidy verse and um, Harvest. So note that when you are installing a package, you need to have the package between quotes. Uh, when you're calling library on the package, the package is already known. Uh, so you don't need quotes. All right, so if I get, if I can get on the chat something like ready, if you're able to run library, tidyverse library by harvest with no problems. Thank you. So we're doing Amazon reviews and the reason uh, why we're doing um, So if you created a, a new R script Oh do PCs need R tools? So you need to install packages R tools? I'm sorry, I'm not a PC user. So you need to do this. Someone is saying. If uh, Laura and the parents having a problem with. Uh, 
So let me give instructions to everyone before I address Lauren's question. Um, I'm using, if you go to Amazon, I'm using this, um, which is one of the most uh, popular with a lot of ratings um, product, but choose a product. Uh, and there are some funny ones, the big for her, Amazon reviews. I always thought that would be nice to look, do like, um, what is big on oh, the name of the pen is. So choose a, and there's also the jelly, uh, big for crystal for her. These, for example, this, these are funny. Choose a product. Um, like again, I'm gonna go with pencil reviews while I address some of the questions um, in the chat. Warning message, file margin file. No such file directory. Our file indexing diagnosis. So it's not fine. Okay. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I see the. So maybe what it seems that it's not finding your your project. What you can do is like go R Studio. You're on a Mac. Um, on a Windows, right? Quit R Studio, whatever you, however you do that. Yeah. So quit R Studio. So go R Studio. Quit R Studio. Go to your folder and open the R proj, which is the R project, which is, should always be how you open a project, and see if that solves your problem. Because it seems like it has having a hard time finding the project, which is weird. If you may have moved the package or you are working in the cloud. So close R and open the project again, see if that helps and if you can open um, a new R script. Oh. Huh. R tools. Okay, so if you cannot work on a project, which is sad, you should, you can close the port project and then try so I, what I did for closing project was to click on the top right um, icon and I did close project. And then we might be able to do that from there, create a new R script without a project. If people are having problems opening a project. I'm gonna open my R project again. I never saw that error actually. Uh, I'm gonna rerun library tidyverse and rvest because um, I just opened my my R. So what I want we want to do is um, if you chose your product, go out scroll all the way down until you find the reviews, and um, and then we're gonna. Oh, well, you're going to click on the see all reviews pay, uh, button. And that's what the page we want, right? So when you see all the reviews, you have some top reviews at the top, but then you have 10 reviews um, at the bottom. And that's what you always want to look for a page that you can you see many items so you can collect all of them. Um, and you see that you can go next page. And when you do so, if I can make my screen a little bigger, um, you see that it's gonna change on the top, your web address has page number two. This is important for when you're, if you want to get several pages, because they're like 20,000 reviews, there are 10, um, 10 reviews per page. So you want to get several pages. You can use this page number, this handy page number, to actually run through all the pages to get those, those reviews. Let's go back to the previous page. And you see that on the top again in the URL, it says page number one, no matter what review you have. So the important thing here is that we have 10 reviews per page. So copy this web address. If you want to use the same page as I am using, I will post it in the, in the chat. 
Um, I'm going to make a comment for my future self. Chosen Amazon review page. I'm going to create a new variable, a new object. I'm going to call this URL, which is just a web address um, abbreviation. And I'm between quotes, I'm going to add this page, this uh, page I call this URL, this web page address that I copied from Amazon. So this URL will hold my my web address. I'm going to run command enter. And then in my global environment, I see your URL there. So that means it was created. So always check a global environment because sometimes I type and I'm typing like really fast all of the commands that are in my head. And then I forget to run them and I don't create an object. And then I try to call it and it's not there, right? So make sure you check your environment to see uh, if it's there. So now our next step is to actually download or read in uh, this URL, which is a HDMI file to our, our environment, the global environment, right? So read in HTML page, uh, assign it to an object called, I'm gonna call my uh, data or my page Amazon reviews. So I start by typing my new variable or my new object that I want to create, Amazon reviews. I'm gonna use the assign symbol. And this function from Arvest called read underscore HTML. I'm gonna hit tab. Whenever it shows you in the autocomplete, that means you have the function, that means that's good. If you don't have read underscore HTML, you may not have run uh, the, library arvest because that's where it's getting from. So the web address that I want to read is saved in this URL variable. So I'm just gonna type URL inside the parentheses, uh, which you call it a parameter, right? So we, this is a function and then we all usually pass something to it. And then what we want to pass is this web address. I'm gonna run this command enter. Uh, you see that Amazon in my global environment there is an Amazon reviews object and it's a list of two. This is just a list, it's HTML. You don't have to worry too much about it. HTML pages are usually uh, divided into head and body. Um, and there is a bunch of different tags, HTML tags in it. I can see the, the same code if I go back to my browser, um, if I, show if I see the source uh, of this, so the actual HTML, your browser interprets these HM, HTML tags and displays to you in a nice format, right? But if I do control or right click or left click, right, I don't know, I haven't used the uh, Windows of seats for so long, I don't know anymore. But whatever, right click, I think, command, control click on a Mac. And if I do view page source, you're actually gonna view uh, see every all the tags and everything that uh, that whenever you post an error, post whatever you typed in, so I know what the what the what caused the error. Um, so this is what actually what the these tags is what R is reading, and what we're looking for. And already, what I usually do with a new web a new website. Um, I look for some text. Can you, people who got an error, can you, yeah, it's read. People who got an error, can you type in what you typed? No applicable method read as applied to an object cost function. Do you do you have what do you have for your URL? So it sounds like URL may be a function. Do you have URL in your as a value in your? No, it's not a spacing error. Um, do you have URL in your global environment? Change this and say like my URL, save it, 
see if it's in your values and use my URL. It sounds like you didn't create the object URL, right? So make sure that maybe change the name to my URL, run it, make sure it's your global environment and then try changing the, the parameter inside of it. And uh, that may, might work because I do think URL is a function. So uh, changing by my URL maybe will help. But, uh, well, let me know if that helped. So what I was going to say is that we need this exact tags that contain the information we want. And what we want here, again, is this 10, I have 10 individual um, reviews. So each one, sites as like Amazon, they're great because they're automatically generated. So there is a pattern to the, to the HTML. So we can retrieve each one of these by the class of these um, of these um, blocks of text. Uh, so what I usually do to identify this is that I look for some text like this one. Oops, let me go back. I click on something. Great price for order this in pencil. This is the, the first chunk I want to retrieve, right? Um, so I'm gonna go to the source and I'm gonna search for this chunk. And I'm gonna find it. It's a mess. It's crazy, right? Don't despair. Um, what we want to do is that. Can you see that all? I don't know. Let me make it bigger. Can I make it bigger? Let me look for it again. So basically, we want to tell R where the the text that we want is exactly inside which tags, right? Because this, there is this H HTML tag. And it looked like there is this review body. What did I say that it was like review text content? That's what we want. Oh yeah, so I want, can you see that there is a right before this great, great parts for the order pencils, although I'm a pencil snob. This is interesting pencil snob. Uh, right before this, there is a class and class is usually what you want to look for. That is a class that says a size base review text, review text content. We're going to go with review text content. This is the block, the individual blocks we want to retrieve. Um, and for the star, I, I want to retrieve not only the text, but also the rating that the person gave. So we can do an analysis of what are the most tokens when the person gives a good rating and what are the most common tokens when people uh, give a low rating. Uh, so the stars part is this five out of four, four out of five stars that we want, right? Right here, five out of four, five stars. So I also want to receive that information, which gives me the rating. And that information, the class that comes right before it is called this A icon out. So I'm going, I'm giving you this information because we're going to use this class names that apply specific to any, specifically to any Amazon reviews you want to scrape, but you can re, re scrape any other website. What you have to do is just look at the code and try to look at the class and where that text is. So you can retrieve those blocks of text. Um, so let's do that. So we're retrieving both the review uh, text yeah, so you don't need, that's a good question. Let me go back to the, so you're gonna see that the class has a bunch of different uh, different units, let's say, right? In this case, everything is um, separated by space. This is formatting information. Uh, so you usually want to get just one of them. You don't need to get the whole thing. So just get one of them. Um, I hope that answers your question. So yeah, so the class usually has more things, just get a chunk that is separated by dashes. Okay, so let's get, get nodes. And these are what they're called. Nodes are everything that is um, wrapped around a, um, a HTML tag that has hopefully, if it's automatically generated, and if it's well-developed, has a class or something. 
that can help you identify what it is. So we're going to get notes uh, for review text. So 10 reviews. And we looked at the, at the HTML and we saw that what we want to do is this retrieve this class that is called review dash text text content. So these are the nodes we want to retrieve. So I'm gonna say this is review text. I'm creating a new object, right? That contains review the review text and I'm gonna assign to it, um, I'm gonna parse or I'm gonna look for these nodes that have review text content. So I'm gonna do the, this the tidy verse way, which it means that I'm gonna start with the data. I always start with the data that I want to base my, uh, my, my computation on. So I start with Amazon reviews. And then, so you see when me using this uh, symbol, which is um, percentage greater than percentage, which is a pipe, uh, which means, and then, so I'm gonna chain different commands. There is a um, shortcut for the pipe in my keyboard. I have to remember because I don't use it. Okay, so on, on a Mac is command shift M. I don't know why it's letter M and my key caster stopped working as usual. Oh, sorry, press N. Uh, so if you do command shift M, you get a pipe. If you do control shift M, or a PC, you get um, the pipe. I usually do a break line after a pipe just to think, keep things organized. So I start with my entire HTML and then pipe, right? And then I'm gonna do HTML notes. So this function looks for, I'm gonna look for all the notes, not just the first one. This function extracts exact notes and the nodes I want are all the ones that have class review text content. Um, if I just run this, I can run this to show you and I look at review text, just type review text and run. It shows you all the 10 notes and the whole HTML we don't want the HTML anymore. We just want the text. So what I'm gonna do is that after my HTML notes, I'm gonna do, and then retrieve only the text. So do HTML text. Don't give me all the HTML. I'm not interested in that. So I'm gonna run this, look at it again. And I should have gotten just a lot of space because that's normal. The, the individual uh, reviews, 10 reviews with a lot of white space, we're gonna fix that. But you should be able to see the 10 reviews. So reviewing what we just did. So created the URL, we read the HTML in as this, and then now we have Amazon reviews is a HTML page. Then we have to parse it to look specifically for nodes we want. So we do our web page, Amazon reviews, and then we get only the nodes that has the specific class. And then we parse it and retrieve only the text. So you should have review text that in your global environment, my review text says it's a character, it's a list of string from size one to 10. I also want to get stars because I want to do an analysis of stars by no, try to, there is a space after, okay, Marina, there is a space after HTML text. I don't think, no, that works for me. Never, never use a space after. Make sure you have a pipe at the end of each of the previous lines. It sounds, Marina, it sounds like you don't have a pipe because it's missing an argument. The argument is missing, it's coming from the two previous lines. You need, yes, so you do need this period here. This period means class because we're looking specific for a class. You don't use the period, like for example, imagine you want to retrieve all the links. 
then you use just a or div or so no dot means uh, the beginning of a tag dot means a class that's what it means so we have a review text um 10 of them so let's get review the stars right get notes for rating and we want the specific class for that is uh, a icon out that's what it's called so we're going to do the same thing as we did before we're going to start with amazon reviews and then we're going to parse for the nodes that has a specific class and then we're going to retrieve only the text so i'm going to call this one review rate or stars i don't know anything you want to call it as long as you know what it is start with amazon reviews and then do the html notes and we're specifically looking for dot a dash icon dash alt and then we do the html text thing to retrieve only the text so i'm going to run this look at it if you rate run it okay great so i have 4.8 out of five stars for you know I, I have the text i need but you note here in my global environment that i have for stars i have 13 stars by 13 lines and for review text i only have 10 and the reason there is a difference is that if i go back to the page you see that um there is this four out of 4.8 out of 5, which is a uh, uh, mean, right, or whatever they do. And then there are two, they have top positive review and top critical review, where there is also stars. So there are three extra ones at the top. We, we You will have access to the recording as you're going to be on, the, on YouTube. I'm going to send you the link. So we want these three top ones, we're not interested. We want only the 10 last ones because these are the ones that uh, match with the text, right? So you say that the last one looks like three stars. Yeah, three out of five stars. Uh, second to last is one out of five stars, right? So I want the top 10. So I'm gonna add, and then I'm gonna add a pipe to my review rate. And I'm gonna say, just give me the last 10. And to do that, I'm gonna do tail. Usually when you're working with any data analysis programming language, you have two functions. Had gives you the top n rows in your data. Tail gives you the bottom n um, in your data. We're gonna do ta tail 10 to get just the top 10. If you get anything not found, that means you don't you check in your global environment, right? So if I type like, for example, review rates, global environment, right? I have review rate. If I do this, I say object not found because I never created. So if you find anything not found, make sure that you ran whatever line it was meant to run that. So in this case, to create review rate, we're doing Amazon reviews, HTML page, and then parse for these nodes with this class, and then extract the text, and then give me the top, the bottom 10 values. I, I, that's why I like Tidyverse, um, because I like how I can read the steps. So that's my personal, this may be new to you, but I, I that's why I teach. And because that's, to me, that's what makes uh, R and our, our, our studio worth uh, using. Okay, so now I have only 10 or stars and I have 10 text. So I have my two things that I need to create my data. So now I can put these two things together and I know that they, they align, right? That the first text is gonna align with the first rating and so on. So now I'm gonna build a data frame that holds, that holds two variables, 
right? So I have the text and the rating. Uh, not data, data frame, data frame. Uh, I'm gonna call my data frame pencil reviews. And I'm gonna assign to it this function that builds a data frame dot data dot frame. Two variables, typing is hard. Two variables, the first one is called text and it will come from this review text, right? So text equals review text. I'm gonna add a comma and space and enter just to keep things organized. Rate equals review rate, type it right. So what I'm doing here is now I have two separate lists. I have 10 stars information and 10 text blocks. I want to make sure that these are in, together in one data frame. So I'm gonna create a data frame and I'm gonna say my column text, get the, the values from this review text I created, my column rate, get review rate from this, um, this list of rate ratings that I created. I'm gonna run this command enter. And you see now that I have in my global environment, this data object with 10 observations. So 10 rows, that looks good. And two variables. If you click on it, it's gonna open it in a different tab. So you can look at the data uh, with a lot of the, the space. We're going to fix that space. It's always a good idea to check to see if uh, it's aligned, right? So for example, the third review, let's look at the third review. Some people are very wordy. One, two, three. Third review is three out of five stars. And it starts with, I got these sharpened pencils for convenience, right? So you just want to check to see if your data makes sense to what was displayed in the HTML page. Good, that looks good. So let's fix some of the problems with this, like the extra space. Oh, all okay. right. So this I'm showing you just one page, right? There is a way to scrape multiple pages. So basically you're gonna do this. Let me, I'm gonna copy. So I have the, the code here with a for loop that what basically does is that you see that my base URL doesn't have the page number in the end. And then I create a for loop from one to 200 that is added to the space. So I, I can scrape to, I can do exactly what we did here, but with 200 pages, right? So every time I, I do the loop, I create page number one, get the text, the rate, and put them together. Page number two, get the text, the rates, and put it together. So I do this for all, for 200 pages and I bind everything together. Um, this takes a while to run. It's here just to show you how to do this. I'm not gonna run it because it's gonna take a few minutes to do so because it's 200 pages. So we're going to read in the Spencer reviews data, which instead of having just 10 observations, which is just from one page, it has 2000. Let me send you in the chat the, this data that I created by running this 200 times, changing the page number. And it's in the notes, so you can do that. Uh, you can run this after the workshop. I just don't want to do it because again, it's gonna take a few minutes. Uh, so let me send you the data, pencil reviews, open. So you should see, it may tell you like, no, this is dangerous. It's just a CSV file, I promise it's not a virus. Uh, you can click to open and download to your computer. So what I'm gonna do with my computer is that I'm gonna add, I'm gonna open my folder where I have my, my project, right? And I'm going to find that file that I downloaded, which is pencilsreviews.rcsv. I can find it. I have so many pages open, I mean, uh, windows open that I have to actually find the right one. Let's see. So I'm gonna get the same file I just sent you in the chat. And I'm gonna make this available as a link 
on the YouTube video. So the Spencer reviews, I'm gonna add just to my folder, to my project folder. And that's where the project is handy because then you don't have to work, worry about setting working directory or anything like that. So I just move it to my project folder. And then if I go back to my R, where is it? I have to find my R studio. Where did it go? Oh, I moved it, that's why. So it's right here. Um, when I go to files now, Okay, I don't know. I, I see that someone got an error in the chat, but let's do, let me do this first. When I go to files now, I see this pencil reviews.csv. So I can just read it in. So read full data file with 2000 reviews, I think. Well, that's what I did. So I do pencil reviews, assign read underscore csv not dot underscore csv and then between quotes i'm gonna do pencil reviews dot csv i'm gonna run this and then you should see in your global environment 2000 observations instead of 10. uh we still have the same problems with spaces that we're going to fix now It's exactly the same, actually, right? Because you do one page at a time. So you always get the, the so the question, let me repeat so the, the recording makes sense. The question, like in the case of 2000 reviews, how does the tail function work? So you're gonna see here in my, in the materials in the for loop. So this repeats 200 times, right? It's exactly the same code we just did. Because for every page, you still want to get the top 10, uh, the bottom 10. So this is exactly the same as we did. It's just repeating 2,000 times, 200 times to get the 2,000 reviews. So the logic doesn't change. It's just because you're, you are process, processing each page individually. All right. So now that we have um, our data, we have to fix some issues, right? So we're going to clean data. Usually I start, I will start a new script that says zero to data cleaning, but I'll just continue this one script. But if you're doing this for real in your research, uh, I highly really recommend that you do separate scripts so that you can start your new script with reading the data in that you scraped. Uh, in this case, what I'm gonna do here, I'm just gonna create many pound signs and say data cleaning. And I'm gonna add at least four pound signs after, and then it creates a little session for me so I can jump back and forth. And I'm gonna, I like to add more so visually I can see where it starts. So next time I would start here, right? I'm just read the data in because I already did all the scraping. So what would we want to do first? Um, I'm looking at my notes, so I do whatever. So it makes sense. So if you look at the data, you see that there's all these spaces. And there is also, let me, I'm gonna print to the console so you can see the line breaks. Yeah, that's why I like R Studio. R Markdown, yes, yeah. I wrote my whole dissertation in R Markdown. Um, print, let's look at, at the text of pencil reviews. So I just want to show you the slash n, which you can kind of see here, slash n, slash n, slash n um, in the global in, uh, environment. So let's start with pencil reviews and then let's select, sorry, I'll do pull instead. Let's pull just the text column. Let me see. Oh, it's two, 2000, it's gonna take a while. Okay. Uh, so you see all this, we can do just, well, let's do, to make this easy, let's do just the top one, the first one, top one. Oh, not top, sorry, it's head. 
head one. Okay, so that just shows you the first one. You see all these slash ends, that means line break. Um, in any type of system, slash end is always line break. We want to remove those. And sometimes I decide whether I want to keep information where the line breaks are, because sometimes that, inf that information is important. But in this case, it seems that it's, it's a lot of line breaks before and after the text. So I'm just gonna replace slash n with nothing. So that means I will delete these uh, line breaks. So let's do that. Look at the first. So remove line breaks, which are represented by a slash n. So to do that, we're going to start with pencil reviews. And then I'm going to use, I'm going to use mutate. And the column I want to mutate is text, right? So that's the column I want to change. And the text is going to be equal text, right? So I'm basically, I, I am basing, I'm just changing the text and rewriting text. Uh, but I want to do a, a replacement and a universal, a global replacement or global substitution. And the function to do that is G sub. G sub is global substitution. It looks for a pattern and replaces with something else. And that pattern is a regular expression. So we need, and then it's telling you here, you need a pattern, a replacement, and whatever you want to change, right? So we want a pattern, and the pattern we want is the slash n. And in R, you do need two slashes to represent the line break. We're going to replace with nothing. And what we want to look for the pattern and replace is text. So I start with my data and then, oh, the CSV file. Let me send the CSV file again. Um, you start with the data and then we're going to change or mutate the text column, which is gonna be based on the same column, but we're doing a global search, looking for line breaks and replacing them with nothing. I'm gonna run this. My results are going to show in the console because I didn't make any assignments here, right? It looks a little better, but there is a lot of space left still. Um, so we want to make sure that that space, which is just space and not line breaks are removed. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna add and then, I'm gonna mutate text again. And what I want to do is use the stream WS, which means removing leading or trailing white spaces. So you want to remove all those extra spaces. So stream WS of text. I could have done this in just one line, right? But I'm doing it in two lines to show you that, you know, each step. Does anyone have a question? I think I heard my mic. My, no, okay. So, so the first mutate, what it does, it replaces the line breaks with nothing, but there is still a lot of spaces. So then I do a trim to get read, rid of uh, the leading and trailing spaces. I'm gonna run this, it's gonna show in my console so I can inspect it. Now it looks good, right? It looks like uh, there is no spaces. I usually do this process where I'm just printing to the console before I actually make any changes to my data frame. Now that it looks good, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna add the same name of the data frame before it and assign. So that means I'm gonna overwrite my data frame. Usually not a great idea, but you know, in this case, we kind of checked that it looks good. I usually want to create a new data frame, but we don't want to like, the problem with creating several data frames is that then your global environment gets so busy, you don't know what's what. So sometimes I think it's worth uh, with small changes like that to re, uh, rewrite, overwrite your data frame. So we are assigning a process we did with pencil reviews of mutate to the same data frame. I'm gonna run this. Now, when I click on pencil reviews to look at it at another tab, you see that the text looks better. 
Okay, so the next step, we want to uh, change the rate here, right? So it says five out of, of uh, out of four point zero out of five stars. Uh, there is no reason to keep this out of five stars. It's just extra information. Just have to keep in mind that you know that it's out of five stars. So let's do the same thing where we remove or we sub out of five stars for nothing. Line 16 looks misaligned. I don't know what you mean by that, Alicia. Alicia, Alicia. Have you done, um, Alicia, have you done view and then pencil reviews? Because I have the same and then I do view and I did view. Yeah. If you click on it, that's what it does. Sometimes when you're scrolling up and down, it may look, there is a space on 16. Oh yeah, there is a little space, you're right. So it's not misaligned, there is just an extra space. I don't know what that space is, let's investigate. Actually on my end, it's, it looks very much misaligned. So yours and mine look different right there. But. It may be just a problem of visualization of, uh, of our studio of actually visualizing this. Okay. Right, so in, sometimes the visualization, you can check. So what you can do the, uh, to look at whether there is an alignment in row 16, you just want to retrieve that specific row. You can index any data frame using square brackets. The, then you give it two numbers. Row and column is always row first and column second. You want to look at row 16, comma, all the two columns, right? So do comma nothing. So this will give you line 16 printed to your console. So sometimes uh, it does, our studio does do like a little, it, it, the visualization here can be a little weird. I don't know if that helps. But. Um, okay, so we're going to replace out of five stars. Oh, with nothing. Let's do this and then just take a little break. Okay, and then we can start doing some tokenization and word countings. Because I just realized it's 11 or two. Well, I mean, it's whatever o'clock, zero two. Um, so, same thing as we did before, right? We're going to do this replacement where we replace out of five stars with nothing. We start with pencil reviews and then you mutate the rate, which you can do just sub because it's just one instance. You don't need global sub, but you can do just sub. That's okay. Uh, we're going to substitute out of five stars by nothing and rate. So we, you're using the same variable, we're just changing it. Enter to see what it looks like. It didn't work, right? Why? Let me pull this rate. It's because the star is, is written wrong. Oh, thank you. I misspelled stars. That's why it didn't work. Uh, out of five stars. Thank you. Yeah, now it seems like it worked. Let me pull it anyways to look at just that. And then pull rate to look at just rate. Yeah, it looks good. There is an extra space there. I probably want to do space out of five stars. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Um, I'm gonna just remove this pool. Look at it again. Okay, now it looks good. So we printed right to my console. So pencil reviews, rate, do a substitution of space out of five stars with nothing, or rate. So now I'm gonna overwrite this by typing the same data um, and do pencil reviews, enter. And then I'm gonna click on it to view it. And now it looks good. Okay, let's take a, take a five minutes break if you need a restroom break or something uh, before we continue to actually counting words. 
So we'll be back whatever o'clock plus 10. So in like six o'clock. see screenshot of what the problem looks like. Oh, huh. can I share this with everyone? Let me see so what can you? Yeah, go for it. So it seems like you didn't get rid of the spaces, right? Let me make this, can I zoom it in? So what you're saying is that it has all of these extra spaces. So the spaces that were now did not really uh, were not removed. Um, so first thing I think uh, comes to my mind is that maybe you don't have the pipe before the mutate trim. So this 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 trim is actually not being not running. I'm looking. Give me one sec. Uh huh. So uh, you know, for people asking for, sorry, Alicia, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I just, uh, looks like I do have a pipe, I, but I don't have pencil reviews pointing at pencil reviews. Oh, okay. So you're never changing it. Mm -hmm. So you're just printing the results to the screen. Yeah. So you need to overwrite it. You actually have to um, affect those changes. Um, so for people asking me for the recording, yes, the recording will be available. Um, I'm gonna, it's gonna be available on the Crow YouTube channel, which has, I have a short link. All the workshops record, all the recordings for all the workshops will be available at rightcrow.org slash YouTube. That takes you to, uh, our YouTube channel. There is a bunch of tools that we've been developing for for corpus building. Um, that don't require oh well, it requires like Python running. But All right, I'm looking at the chat. When you go back to the script, I'll, yeah, so you can also go, I always go back to the page, right? I'm following whatever I have on this page. So when I was like, um, so I don't know where you want me to go back to. 
I can also send you this script, this the my script right now, which I'm gonna make available in that same page, but let me send you just in case you want to look at it. So this is what I have right now. I'm sending in the chat. So someone's saying, well, when I overwrite the data, I only get the rate, the text, what? The text is missing. So you don't have two columns. You don't have um, total observations. So rerun, I would say rerun starting. Oh, did you do the, did you load from my file? So I will say rerun every line and make, see if that helps, that solves the problem. So rerun every line, look at your pencil reviews. I do have two variables. We run the next line, see at what point this ch two changes to one. So you can identify where the problem is. It happens after we clean, okay. Are you overriding rate and rate in your mutate? We have mutate rate and rate as the base for it. Yeah, if you want to copy and paste the, your code so I can try to figure out what if you want to well, copy and paste whatever you have here um, to the chat, I may be able to tell you what the problem is. Yeah, it looks fine to me. Let me copy and paste my, my, so this is what you have. Look, except pencil reviews, pencil reviews, mutate rate. Yeah, looks fine to me. So if you maybe clean your global environment. So what I did was, sorry, there is a little broom in your global environment. Click on it, say yes. So what you have to do is load the two libraries. Oh, RFS, you actually don't need it, just tidyverse. And then run the read CSV. Oh, okay. So you found the problem and just rerun everything. Yeah, that's usually the problem. Like whatever you're overriding, it's like you may have run twice. So running everything from scratch is usually helpful. Okay. So now we have, we can start doing some uh, analysis. So let's tokenize the text. So when we have text and rate. So now what we want to do to be able to count individual words is to, Instead of having text, we want to have each observation, each row in our data to be one token or one word. Tokenization in English is easier than in other languages. Um, I'm gonna show you how to do, nice Elisa, um, how to do tokenization using the tidy text library. So let me do this session here. Tokenize. Oh, sorry. Why do I forget where things are sometimes? I think when I look at the keyboard, like, or, yeah. Now I have tokenized text. I'm going to load library tidy text, which is the library we use for tokenization. Um, and I'm going to show you what I mean by it. It may not make sense right now. You want to tokenize text. That means that instead of having the whole text, we want individual words. In English, tokenization is much easier because usually it's just separating by space, right? Except like with things like I'm, uh, which you might need to, not, we might want into different, as different, two different words, right? Uh, this tokenization process does get rid of uh, sentence boundaries and the tweet boundaries. So we want to keep the information about which words belong together in the same, not tweet, sorry. I'm talking about, I did a workshop yesterday about tweets. That's why, I'm sorry about that. We want to make sure that we have um, a text ID so that we know all words belong to this same text, right? So let's create that ID first. So once we tokenize things, 
we still can retrieve which words belong together to the same review. Um, so first step, create a text document. In our case, it's a review ID because we don't have that, right? We just know that each line is a different review. Um, but think, things were going to change our lines. We better do this um, ID. So we're going to overwrite our pencil reviews based on our pencil reviews. And then we're going to mutate. In this case, we're going to create a new column that doesn't exist. I'm going to call this new column review ID. And this review ID is going to be equals to my row number. So basically, I'm going to use my row number, row number as, um, as my ID, which would be like one, two, three, four. I'm going to run this. And then look again at my pencil reviews. And now I have this ID that goes from one to 2000, right? So I just don't, don't lose that information. Now that we have our review ID, and I also do this with tweets. Anyways, every time you have some, you want to, before tokenize, make sure that you have an ID so you know you can retrieve when words work together. Uh, tokenize words in text. Tokenize. And this time I'm going to create a new data frame. I'm going to call pencil reviews underscore tokenized. And I'm going to assign to this, let me add some space here, uh, based on my pencil reviews. And then I'm going to use this unnest underscore tokens for a function. And I want to tokenize by word given my text. So here I have my output input. So this function is going to get my text, which is this column here, and it's going to return to me individual words. Run this to create this new data frame pencil reviews tokenized. Now I have here on my global environment, global reviews tokenized. If I click on it, uh, we see the difference, right? So what it did was like this. So let me go back. I'm gonna go, go back and forth to show you the difference. So the text here, and if you have extra spaces, that's okay because it removes extra spaces. Great price for order, right? So I have great price for order. This in pencils, although I'm, uh, right? So now each observation in this um, data frame is equivalent to one word. So now I can count rows and that will, will result into counting. Um, I can count rows and that results in counting um, words. Yeah, let's do that. Now that we have this new data frame. So count words. Um, let's count words per, per rate, right? So I'm we have five different rates, oh, stars, right? And let's just do a count of how many tokens for each one of these subcategories, these five categories of, of, of stars. Count words per rate, five levels total. So to count words now, we just count rows, starting with the Spencer Reviews tokenized data, underscore reviews tokenized, and then we're going to count word and rate. Rate and word, 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 word and rate is fine. We can do the opposite, we can do rate and word. It's just gonna show you in different order. I'm gonna run this, I'm gonna print to my console. It's gonna see that a word is by alphabetical order. So this is like rate, one star, word, the number one, how many times this shows up, three times the word one shows up within the category rating one star. Uh, usually when I'm just printing results to the console, I want to make sure that I see the highest N 
first. So I'm going to do an arrange here. I'm going to use and then arrange by n. If I just do this, I'm going to see smallest n first. So I'm going to see all the ones first. I want to see largest first. So I'm going to add a minus to n. So I, I do the inverse of this order. So I see the highest words first. So anyone who's done any counting of words in English knows that the is the most frequent word in the in the in English, right? In any corpus. So the it's very frequent. Pencils is very frequent, right? Not surprisingly. Uh, and then we all have we have all of these. Um, a lot of function words, like prepositions and some pronouns, right? Which is normal, is expected uh, for any corpus in English. So I'm, I'm thinking about what to do this. I'm gonna, because I'm looking at the time and I do want to get into the sentiment analysis. Um, I'll show you how to remove some words. You usually, all right, Marina, make sure that you have the pipe. Do you have pencils reviews? If you're counting, do you have pencil reviews? Oh, we're counting, sorry. Do you have pipe at the end of each line? No, so the question is, um, is the tokenization function case sensitive? So this unnest function lower cases everything. So that's the other thing you have to keep in mind that it does that for you. It doesn't, uh, yeah, so it's not, case sensitive because it does the lower case. So you, your words are gonna be all lower case. So if you go to unless tokens, there might be an option there for, so I do question mark unless call, call the name of the function to get some usage. Yeah, so there is that to lower equals true. I can change this default here. I can see to lower equals false and that will not lowercase things in case you want to keep the difference, right? So I is uppercase. It takes out punctuation, yes, which is to me is very annoying uh, because I like punctuation. So this unless function will remove punctuation. What you can do is that you can do before you do unless tokens, you can do um, by sentence. So you can do the tokenization by sentence first, and then you can create a sentence ID and then do a tokenization by, by word. So you can have information about at least which sentences, which words belong in which sentences together, but it does remove punctuation. So I'll show you how to plot this. Uh, although we, we do have a lot of the words, the most frequent words are common English words, but plotting to me is always fun. So let's plot top 10 most frequent words per rate category, right? So we have five. So we start with the same count we did here. And the pencils reviews underscore tokenized. And then I do the count by weight and word. So this gives me a data frame with three variables that I can plot. Rate, which is one, two, three, four, five stars, the individual word and the count and raw count, right? Raw frequency. Um, now that we have that count, we can plot it. I do ggplot. And then you always define the aesthetics of your map of your plot. So AES. And then you map your variables, which I only have three here, to X, Y. And because I have three, uh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna split my bar chart. So I'm gonna plot a bar chart, five individual bar charts, one for each uh, of the five ratings. So let's start here. I'm gonna do X. Equals. So you map usually in your map in your plot you have the y axis and the x axis, right? And you map 
these two variables in your data. So I'm going to map x to rate. So whenever I'm mapping words, I like to map uh, words to the y because then you can read them. So I'm do x to n, which is my count. I'm going to add a, sp a space to uh, enter to look nicer here. Y, I'm going to map to my word. Um, oh, yeah. So be yeah, OK. And then I, I'm going to do a geom call, which is a bar plot. Before running this, this is a huge data table, right, with 7,000. Um, we're going to get there, Juan Victor. Actually, if you go to my, uh, my materials, yes, that's what we do. We, we, we do positive and negative words. But not yet. Let me just plot this first. So there are too many words to plot, right? I'm not going to plot all seven words. So let's top, uh, like we said, the top the top ten most frequent word for rate. So to do that, before the ggplot, we need to make sure we ha we get the top ten most frequent words for rate. So we're going to do group by rate, and then we're going to do top n to get those top. 10 words um, and pipe. Don't forget the pipe at the end of each of, each of these uh, lines. So this gives me the top 10 for each rate. Um, all right. So the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to add a plus, and I am going to do a facet wrap. So I split my one bar plot into five for each one of the different star categories. So I'm going to do a tilta, which is, means by uh, rate. Just before I run it, let me review it. What we did here, we start with our data tokenized, which has one word per row. We count rate and word. And then we group by rates to make sure we get the, the most 10 frequent words per each of the five categories in ratings. Uh, and then we plot our x axis to the raw frequency, our y axis to the actual word, and then we split we split our chart into five. I run this. Doesn't look great. We can make it better. Uh, so the one thing is that you're going to see that the the words for all categories are fixed, right? Because uh, by default R does that. It keeps all the words fixed for all of them, but not all of them have them as most frequent. So let's make Y free so that we can have those words specifically to each category. So I'm going to do scales equals quote free underscore Y so that I free the Y scale so it's not the same for all of my subplots. So now I have individual words for each one of my star ratings. It's still not great because although they repeat a lot, but the, um, they are not ordered. They're just in alphabetical order. I like to order them by frequency. So I'm going to reorder word by N. And let's see if this is going to work just with reorder, because sometimes you have to do reorder. And I'm going to do a reorder of my word, my Y axis by N. Let me see if this works. Oh, it didn't work. Okay, so I have to do reorder within. That means that I have to order by n, but considering the individual groups. Uh, so considering rate. This is gonna be better, but it's still gonna be ugly because <laughs> we have to get rid of this uh, extra. Can you see that repeats the the one and the two and the three. Let's remove that. I do a plus at the end of my chart and I do a scale Y reordered. That would remove those extra. Um, all right, this looks better. Remember these are rough frequencies and the rating is very high. So of course, like I have more words for five stars. 
and there is a lot of function words here, but you can see that the most frequent, most the ten most frequent words for five stars, Spencer's the for a lot of these um, function words. Um, all the other ones seem to be like there are a lot, a lot of not a lot of content words, right? Because of all of these uh, function words and preposition, which are prepositions and articles and close um, class words. One way to fix that is to remove these words, which are also called stop words. I usually don't do this um, because uh, the list of stop words is really big. There is a stop words data frame. I'm going to run this. It has, let me do view with a capital V. The stop words um, has three lexicons, has a bunch of words that they deemed uh, not important. Um, you do have to probably create your own list. Don't make, um, don't just use this without really thinking about this, but I'm just gonna show you how to use it. So to remove stop words, we can do pencil reviews tokenized, and then we're going to overwrite it. We're going to do pencil reviews tokenized, and we're going to do an anti join to remove stop words. So this will remove my my stop words. And now I can run the same plot. I'm just going to copy and paste it here. And you see that um, it's a little bit different. Oh yeah, so we didn't do the the the. Is there a stop word list for Portuguese? Probably, I don't know uh, which one, but there must be. I know in Python there is, so there must be one for R. Um, we didn't do the the casing, right? So, because I did change that. So let me fix that actually. Let me rewind the tokenization. I'm gonna remove this to lower from tokenization because of the, the I'm gonna run everything. So that uh, we don't have that problem. All right, so here is a little um, better. I don't know. Again, do not recommend just using the stop words. Uh, Anna, are you having are uh, using a different website? Or are we to use my data frame? No, I'm using your data frame. Actually, now that be I've, getting the I've done this, this looks very similar, but the previous plots had different words. <laughs> That's oh, weird. I don't know. Sorry. Maybe because I didn't do, maybe I had the lower, the, the to lower false. Maybe that's why. All right. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's do a little bit of uh, what's called sentiment analysis which again is not something that I recommend using blindly. How did I get rid of capitalization? Yes, I just, in my tokenization, in the unnest on this thing here, unnest tokens, if you do question mark unnest tokens, there is a, uh, a parameter that the default for it is true. So before what I had done is that I had added this as a demonstration. I had moved, I had changed this from true to false. Uh, so this keeps the, the, the original capitalization. And to lower true, make, it just ensures everything is uh, lowercase. Yes, I can do that. Remove stop words. Um, so in the same vein of like word lists, there is a lot of word lists out there and people in corpus linguistics will probably um, 
remember some of the tools out there with word lists. R also has a bunch of word lists. Uh, one of the word lists is about sentiment. And I'm scrolling down to find the sentiment analysis. Um, it started with these word lists, or basically you, you have this crowdsourced list or for each word, people assign a feeling or a positive or negative rating. Um, and this list can be used to, to categorize words. Like we did with like, we removed the, the we removed the stop words, which is a list someone created. Uh, so we can do that for the sentiment analysis. So the data frame that comes with this is called sentiments. So let's look at it. I'm gonna do a view with capital V to look at the uh, sentiments. So that's gonna pop it up in a different uh, tab. So you see that uh, you have the word, abnormal was rated as negative, abort was rated as negative. Uh, I'm gonna click on this filter thing. I'm gonna look for the word blue, no blue. Did I type full blender? I don't know. I thought that was a blue for this. Maybe not, huh? Is this, oh, because, wait, there is, oh, because there are different sets of sentiment. Okay, so this is just negative and positive. So there are different data sets you can do, get sentiments to get different lexicons. So a fin, I know, right? That's the problem. Someone's mentioned like the individual words, it doesn't take the context of the word into, um, into account, right? And word balancey, like the, the, the word sentiment changes according to, the, to the, the context. That's what I was going to say blue. In one of these, there, so there are different lexicons. This one has a, has a value. This is a thin one. Um, at sentiments, I'm just doing question mark at sentiments to show you that uh, they talk about the three lexicons. So there is Bing, Epin, oh, there's four lexicons. And each of these lexicons give you a different word list with different, um, it doesn't take into account any syntax, no. It's just a lexical based uh, value, which yes, it's very, it, I don't know, but that's whenever you see a plot with sentiments, that is usually what they did. They went just by lexical item. Um, so one of these, it has like anger, joy, and blue is as anger. So what about blue eyes? Yeah, I'm feeling blue. I think it's sadness that is the feeling. So yes, it's a problem, right? Because it's just going by lexical items. Um, more modern sentiment analysis are usually classification problems with machine learning algorithms. And I did paste in section seven in the, in the notes, you, I have a link to a review of the different types of algorithms used for sentiment analysis. So basically, yes, you want to take into account syntax or you know the context, at least the context, or like the neighbors of the word, the locations, to make a decision about um, that the if the word is negative or positive. Um, so keep that in mind. I don't know. It's oh yeah, you may have to download these these lexicons. So let's just do the regular sentiments, which is just a list and then it has negative or positive. Uh, so we want to join basically to add that information to the, the pencils reviews tokenized, right? So for each word here, we want to have a sentiment associated with that word. So to do that, we're going to join sentiments with pencil reviews tokenized. So we start with pencil reviews tokenized and then we assign let me actually do a different data frame. Pencil review sentiment. 
And then I'm going to create a new data frame, which is starts with this pencil reviews tokenized, which has one word per um, line per row. And then we're going to do a left join. Hmm, I can do just a left join. Well, let me do a left join like this with sentiments. Let me see if this works. So what I'm doing here is like starts with pencil review and just add, keep this on the left and add to the right, the sentiments. So I'm using a left join. Let me look at uh, pencil review sentiments. So you see that for a lot of words, price doesn't have a sentiment. Uh, pencil doesn't have a, a sentiment, is knob, is negative. Although like I'm a pencil snob, I don't know if that will say that's negative or not. Anyways, again, not my, I wouldn't do this, but in general. Uh, so now we can plot, we can count, instead of co co uh, counting frequent of word, frequency of words per rate, we can do the same count, but doing by sentiment, right? Um, count word, frequency by sentiment. So to do that, I start with pencil review sentiment, and then I do a count of word by sentiment or sentiment by word. Um, I'm gonna run this. It's gonna give me a lot of NAs. We want to remove the NAs Probably, but I think if I do, uh, if I get the top N, I'm gonna not have the problem with the knees. Let's do that. I want to group by sentiment. And I want to get the top 20 most frequent words by sentiment. Yeah, so the knees are not there. Oh, there are some knees. We have to remove the knees. Because like two is very frequently apparent because it's the number of the, the pencil. So you have to make sure that if we don't have that information, we, we don't include it. So before my count, I'm gonna do a filter to remove all the sentiment NAs. To check if something is an A, you do is, is an A for sentiment. But we want to keep only those that are not an A. So I'm gonna do an exclamation point for not. So let me walk you through that. Start with the pencil review sentiments. Filter, so you keep the sentiment that is not an A. Then you count word per sentiment. You group by sentiment to get the, the top 20 more frequent words by sentiment. So let's look at this. Okay. So it looks like a good data frame. Let's plot this because plotting is more fun and it's actually easier sometimes to look at the table that is this big. So plotting, did you, did you plot? Aesthetics, we're going to do a similar mapping. We do X to word, no, X to N because it's frequency. Y to word plus geom, um, geom call. I'm thinking there are many ways of doing this in the in the line in the notes. I did something else, and let's split by sentiment. Facet wrap by sentiment. Um, yeah. Oh, my thing started working again. Okay, so again, same thing, uh, the Y, let's make the Y free and reorder the words. So I'm gonna do a comma, scales equals free Y. So that I keep a list of negative separate from positive in the Y axis. And let's uh, reorder word. Let me see if it does a, I don't think I reorder word by N, if this is gonna work. Sometimes reorder works, but sometimes have to do a reorder within. Oh, you work. All right. 
So I just added in the Y a reorder of word by N. So we actually have a word. So here are negative and positive words in the reviews. Um, so negative, people talk about a lot of breaking and cheap, cheap and hard, waste, bad. And then positive, lad, I don't think that's what they meant by positive. They probably thought it was lead and not lad, but I'm pretty sure in this, they are talking about the lad. Um, so again, this, you have to take into account that it's just one, um, just one individual word, right? That takes into account. Um, I only have 15 minutes. I just want to tell you what else I have in this document. In addition to the sentiment analysis, I did do a different plot at the end here. So I have the code here for this plot. So what I did here is that if this negative, uh, the sentiment is negative, I multiply the value by, by minus one. Something that you might want to look at is, um, in addition to calculating just raw frequencies, uh, I have here how to calculate range. Um, so word range, so range is important, right? Because you want to make sure that you have words that occur in many, many reviews. Um, I also have normalized frequency here because you don't want to go by just rough frequencies. You actually want to calculate normalized frequency. Yeah, so we can normalize it. So what I'm saying here is that there is more here than what we just covered. You have an index at the beginning of the, the document. Um, we also, I also de, do here, like if ratings that are five, um, that are five, do we have like positive, what are the positive words for ratings that are five, five stars or for ratings that are one stars? Uh, we do, I do have 13 minutes if you have any extra questions that I might help you with. Thank you for watching this recorded webinar.